Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Good morning. How is everybody? Good. Well, I'm Joel. I'm going to finish our series today called Run to the Battle. Interesting title we picked this month. First, I want to start off by saying something. I love our pastors, Marcus and Natalie. My pastor, Marcus and Natalie. I ha- like, I've been mad all week. Sorry, I know a pastor shouldn't confess that, but straight up. I've just been mad all week. You ever, anybody ever felt that way? You're just like, I don't even know what I'm mad about. I'm just mad. <laughs> and, then, and then I realized the message I had picked for today, and I'm like even madder at myself now. Because oh, no. I don't like the passage we're going to cover today in Scripture. I wish it wasn't in there, but it's in there, and it's probably what I need to hear this week, and maybe it's what you need to hear this week, hopefully, um, but anyways, Pastor Marcus and Natalie just came, I think they sensed something was the bad vibe or something, and they just came and prayed over me and ran all the demons off, so I think we're good, so anyways, I love them, I love, how, here's what I love about them, they are super sensitive to the Spirit of God speaking, and when you live in a world this crazy, you've got to be able to hear the voice of God. Because all the junk around you is going to tell you completely opposite of what the voice of God wants to tell you. And you've got to be able to hear the voice of God through all that noise. And they are so gifted at that. They're not perfect. We know that, right? But man, they're, what an encouragement that even messed up people like them can hear the voice of God, right? It's encouragement to me because, you know, all of us, we're like, well, I don't know. You know, I didn't live right this week. But you know what? You can still hear from God. And I just love that about them. They are sensitive to, and that's one of the biggest things I've been learning from them, is just the importance of walking by the Spirit, living a Spirit-led life. So, thank you. So, this week we're going to finish up our series called Run to the Battle. And we're going to talk about a battle that, we're going to look at something that's from the life of David that honestly I wish the story wasn't in there. Because it really messes with me, okay? So um, this story goes against everything that is my natural tendency. And you know, if you've probably noticed this, if you've been walking with the Lord for a while, the stuff God asks of us when Jesus came to earth and he preached the Sermon on the Mount, the things he asks of us are really hard. G.K. Chesterton, he said, you know, the Christian ideal hasn't been tried and found wanting. It's been found difficult and left untried. It's so hard what God asks us to do that apart from the power of God living within us, we can't do it. So that's why it requires living by the Spirit every day. Amen. And what we're going to talk about today is a particularly hard battle for me, okay? So there's this, there's this personality profile, and there's all sorts of opinions about it. It's called the Enneagram. And uh, it, it's like basically this personality profile that talks about the energy you project onto the world. And you're like, well, what is it? Some people think it's voodoo. Some people think it's demonic. I don't know. Bottom line is... It's been really helpful for me in understanding myself. And there's this book, I highly recommend it, called The Road Back to You by a guy named Ian Crone. And in it, he starts off the book describing my personality type. There's nine personality types, right? And this is me to a T. I have been told that I am too blunt and aggressive. Doing things halfway is not my spiritual gift. I enjoy a good verbal fight just to see what others are made of. In relationships that matter to me, I insist on being honest about conflict, and I stay in to fight until things are worked out. I do not trust people. (laughs) Justice is worth fighting for. I can sniff out other people's weakness the first time I meet them. (laughs) All you people thinking you wanted to hang out with me, now you're like, maybe I don't. (laughs) I love opposition. Bring it. I don't like people who beat around the bush, and I'm wary of people who are too nice. I have no problem confronting a bully. (laughs) What we're going to talk about today is the total opposite of that. We're going to talk about a story in the life of David where David, a warrior, chose to not fight a battle, and it was the right decision. And this is the challenge in our life is there's some battles that we need to fight, And there's some battles that you need to let the Lord fight for you. 
Because there's some battles you just can't win apart from the Lord fighting for you. Or if you fight them, it will be a big, bloody mess that you'll make out of it. And so it, it really the, the, what the message today is about is trusting the Lord with your future, which is something that's hard for me because, remember, I don't trust in general. So we're going to talk about something that th this message really, as I've been preparing it this week, I'm like, this is the wrong message for this week because really what we need right now in this world is fighters. But maybe it's not what we need right now. I'll throw that out to you. As the message is done, hopefully the Lord will speak to you, um, specifically to your situation. But the question I want to ask you this morning is this. How do you respond when what you live for and love is threatened? You ever had that situation? Where something you really value, a relationship is being threatened, your marriage is being threatened, um, you know, you're on the verge of divorce, you see somebody that's flirting with your spouse, you're like, oh, it's, I'm be, you know, you're being threatened. How do you respond when that happens? When your financial situation is threatened, when you've been unjustly accused of something at work, when somebody's been playing politics at work and they got the promotion that was rightly yours, and they had no right to get it, and they're the worst possible person for the job, but somehow they're related to the guy in charge. How do you respond when what you love is threatened? Because, you know, it's a lot easier to act like a Christian than to react like a Christian. And you figure out where you really stand in your faith based on how you react. Because when you, how you react is what comes up out of the deep parts of you, and you're like, where did that come from? You can act like a Christian all day long, but then when something happens that jolts you and shakes you like a, a, a bucket that's full of something, you're going to see what comes out of it. And you got to decide, do I really believe this thing or am I going to just keep acting like I believe this thing? Because when the rubber meets the road and life hits you in the face, you'll see what you're really made of and what's really inside. And sometimes we see stuff that we really don't like. Whenever we're, we're threatened... The natural human response is one of three things, okay? We either go one of these three ways. We either fight. That's my end over here. I'm just a fighter. I'll just fight it no matter what. I fight things I probably shouldn't fight just because I like fighting. <laughs> Some people freeze. You ever met those people that you're just like, something happens and you're like, what is wrong with them? Why are they just standing there? Like, what's going on? It's, it's when panic hits, when, when, when we're frightened. or Some people just freeze. And then others, they flee. And the crazy thing is you'll have one response in one situation and another's response in another. At work, you may be a fighter, but at home, you're a fleer. You run from things at home because you're like, man, I just don't. Uh, maybe you're the fighter at home precisely because you run from everything at work. So you're in spite, fights with your spouse all the time, taking it out on them for something they had nothing to do with, but it's something at work that you needed to confront. But you're fighting at home instead of fighting the person at work where you need to stand up for yourself. It's really tricky, right? But we all have these responses. And the crazy thing is, we all have some really classic responses that's, that some of them fit into the fight response and some fit into the flee response. One of those responses I've seen is deception and lying. Now what's crazy is, for some people, this is a fight response to deceive and to lie. And for some people, this is a flight response. We deceive and we lie. So something happens, you know, you don't like what's going on, so you're like, well, if I just bend the truth a little bit, I can get things to work out for me. Because this is going to really messy in the future. So you lie. This is why people lie. This is why governments lie. And make no mistake, governments lie. For some, it's avoidance. This is our fight or flight, right? I, I see this as more of a flight thing. But being passive aggressive is a fight thing. So you don't fight the person directly in the face, but you just start stirring up trouble around in the office. Hey, did you hear what Sir Patel said? And he did that. And he goes, gosh. And you start, you know, doing nasty things behind people's back. And you, and you tell yourself you're noble because you're not doing it to their face. But is that really noble? It's avoidance. It's passive aggression. And it's a fight or a flight response. It depends. Another one's manipulation or coercion. You can't get people to do what you want them to do, so you figure out ways to manipulate Right? This is all based on fear and fight or flight. Worried about a vaccine? You've got the power to mandate it? Mandate it. Coercion. That's what that word means. Forcing people to do something they wouldn't otherwise do. So you use power and you use your power to get what you want ultimately because of your own fears and your own what's been threatened in your life. 
and other people don't feel threatened by it, but you do, so you coerce other people, and you become a controller and a manipulator. God, it's like super quiet in here. Y'all okay? <laughs> Here's another one I see, scorched earth. I literally am dealing with some friends right now that this is happening. The divorce is imminent, and now they're just trying to see who can destroy the other one the most. And in the process, the kids are getting slaughtered. It's just getting messy. There's posts on Facebook about what a horrible person I'm married to and this and that and you know, imp- putting everybody's dirty laundry out there and showing the whole world what a shameful person your, your spouse, soon to be your ex is. And they just go into scorched scourge church and they're like, man, I'm just going to make everybody pay. And sometimes it's not even the person who hurt you that you make pay. You just make anybody pay that looks like the person who hurt you. So maybe cert- somebody from a certain race hurt you in a certain way, and you've just said, man, everybody that's that race, they're the problem. And so you just scorch the earth going after those people. Maybe it's women, all women. No, it's not all women. Maybe it's all men. So any man, you know, maybe you were violated by a man, and you just got this thing against men that you just can't get over, and like all men want is this. And so you've got this idea in your mind, and so you just want to scorch the earth with anything that has to do with the patriarchy. Or the matriarchy, that's the other side of it, right? That's what happens. We scorch the earth, and we live in a world right now that loves to scorch the earth. Anybody that hurt me, I'm going to make anybody that looks like them pay. There's no forgiveness in that. It's destructive. It's a fight, it's a fight or maybe it's a flight response. Because oftentimes what we're running from is we need to deal with our own demons, but we project it on others, which is where scapegoating comes in. And scapegoating is finding one person to blame, and you just say, all of my problems are because of that. I was talking to somebody this week. It was the most ridiculous conversation I've had. I walked away mad. It's probably why the whole... <laughs> they were telling me the reason they hadn't moved. They were going to move, blah, blah, blah. Why haven't you moved? Well, because we were going to move into this one house, but that guy doesn't like Mexicans. And I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, we were going to move across the country, but this, this one guy, he didn't like Mexicans. I'm like, was that the only house in town that you could move to? No, no, but man, we just knew like nobody there likes Mexicans because that guy wouldn't let us live into the house because he didn't like Mexicans. Well, then I started digging a little bit more, and it actually sounds out it's because they're really horrible neighbors. But there's always something we can scapegoat, right? I'm not saying racism ain't real. It's totally real. But oftentimes we need to look a little bit deeper at who are we blaming for things when really what we need to look at is are we making excuses and just finding somebody to blame for our excuses? It's a hard line. It's hard to know. All right, let's close in prayer. I'm just kidding. (laughs) So there's a story in the life of David that I don't like. David, his son Absalom, has gotten mad at him. His son is really mad at him. And his son starts raising up an army to fight David. Now listen, David had made some mistakes. One, David's kids had been behaving badly and David didn't confront them. And one of his daughters got really hurt. And so Absalom was so mad for his, his sister that his dad didn't do anything to avenge his daughter that he, anger and bitterness starts building. Well, then Absalom starts getting people on his side. And eventually he raises up an army and he decides to invade Jerusalem and run David, his own father, out of power. Now, David was a fighter. Make no mistake, God didn't let him build the ark or the, uh, the, um, the temple, because he had too much blood on his hands. David's like, I'm going to build you a temple. God and God's like, <laughs> no, buddy, you got a lot of blood on your hands. I'm not going to have you building the temple. Um, now, which is weird because Solomon built the temple and Solomon had a lot of blood on his hands too, but it's one of those things in the Bible I don't understand. It's beyond my pay grade. But the bottom line is this, David was a warrior. And if he wanted to, he could have, by the sheer force of his knowledge of war, by his own fighting skills and by the bad, awesome, like bad, you know what I mean, men around him, like dudes that could kick butt were around him, he could have taken out his son like that. But here's how David responds. A messenger came and told David, the hearts of the people of Israel are with your son Absalom. So David said to all of his officials who were with him in Jerusalem, come, we must flee or none of us will escape from Absalom. We must leave immediately or he will move quickly to overtake us and he will bring ruin on us and put the city to the sword. So the king's official answered him, your servants are ready to do whatever our Lord the king chooses. They're basically saying, David, we fought stuff like this before and we still got it. We can take him out. 
David had an army at his disposal. But the king set out with his entire household following him. And this is where it gets really interesting. Zadok, he's the priest, right? He's the high priest there. And all the Levites who were with him were carrying the Ark of the Covenant of God. Now, the Ark of the Covenant of God was the sign of God's presence on earth. When you had the Ark with you, it was a sign that God was on your side. You remember when the children of Israel brought the Ark into, e into Israel? They always sent the priests with the ark into the battle, right? And they were like, this means God is with us. We're going to win the victory. But David does something weird. They set down the ark of God and Abiathar offered sacrifices until all the people had finished leaving the city. So there's this mass exodus from the city. It brings Im images to mind of Ukraine this week, seeing all that traffic trying to leave town as this, this army is invading. Then the king said to Zadok, look, take the ark of God back into the city. If I find favor in the Lord's eyes, he will bring me back and let me see it and his dwelling place again. But if he says, I'm not pleased with you, then I'm ready. Let him do to me whatever seems good to him. Do you realize what he's saying here? He's saying, send the presence of God away from me and leave it in the town. Because if God wants me back in this role, I'll take it. But if he doesn't, I'm not going to hold it too tightly. I heard Elizabeth, I think it was Elizabeth Elliot. No, it was Corey Tim Boom said, hold everything in your hands lightly. Otherwise, it hurts when the Lord rips it away. And you look at David and you go, man, this is, this is, a, this is a difficult passage for me. Because I kind of think, well, was David abdicating his responsibility to his people to defend the town? And he had the power to do it. And shouldn't a leader do that? And it's really tricky, but in this situation, we see that David felt like the right response was to not fight the battle on those terms. Now, he ultimately fights a battle, we'll see. And he ultimately, his son is defeated. But he chose to not fight. He chose to say, I'm going to trust the Lord with my future. If he's done with me, so be it. But if he's not, nobody can stop the Lord from restoring me to the place that I'm supposed to be but I'm not going to kill a bunch of people in the process to find out. And that's the really hard part. Because when we get angry, when we get hurt, when we get abused, when we get attacked, we tend to go scorched earth. We say, oh, I can, I'll show you. You want to attack me? I will show you. I'm going to make your life hell. And we fight. Yes, I said hell in church. It's a real place, yeah. This is a quote by Gene Edwards, and I think it's brilliant. He says this, Beginning empty-handed and alone frightens the best of men and women, but it also speaks volumes of just how sure they are that God is with them. And my question for you is, if God's asking you to start from scratch, empty-handed and alone, or maybe restart from scratch, empty-handed and alone, are you going to be willing to lay down everything you've had and say, all right, Lord, I trust you with it? Or are you going to fight to hold on to it? And sometimes you have to restart alone. By no fault of your own, your spouse has left you, abandoned the family. You've been hurt, violated by someone, and you're starting all from scratch, a financial ruin because of somebody else's fault, and you're having to restart alone. And the question is, are you going to be angry and bitter, or are you going to trust that even if you start empty-handed and alone, God is with you? Amen. And he will restore what the locust has eaten, as one of the Proverbs says, or one of the Bible verses says. And this is a challenge fight. And I, I look at David and I go, why did David respond this way? And I think it has to do something with something that happened to him earlier in his life where David chose the wrong response. And if you look at this story, David, remember, he was hunted down by Saul. Remember, he kills Goliath. He becomes really popular in, in Israel. And everybody's like, Saul's killed thousands, but David has killed 10,000s. And all of a sudden, Saul starts to realize David's more popular than me. So he starts to hunt down David. Well, when David finds out that Saul's after him, there's a story in his life that, that here's what he does. David went to a town called Nob, right? To Ahimelech, the priest. And Ahimelech trembled when he met him and asked, hey, why are you alone? Why is no one with you? So David's fleeing, right? He is scared. Everything he loves is being threatened. Everything he's lived for is being threatened. His own life is being threatened through no fault of his own. He was the guy that had the courage to stand up against Goliath. No fault of his own. He's running. But David chooses this response. So David answered Amalek the priest, Oh, the king sent me on a mission and said to me, 
No one is to know anything about the mission I'm sending you on. He lied. He deceived. He said, oh, I'm on a secret mission. I can't tell you anything about it. As for my men, I've told them to meet me at a certain place. What men? He had no men. Later he had men. But right here, it's just him, empty-handed and alone, running for his life. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever you can find. He says, man, I need some food and resources. I'm doing this for the king, remember? So if you do anything wrong, the king's going to make you pay. He lies to the priest. That's pretty bad, lying to the priest. But the priest answered David, well, I don't have any ordinary bread on hand. However, there is some consecrated bread here. It's this holy, sacred bread. Provided the men have kept themselves from women. And David's like, yeah, yeah, they have. You know, there's all these Old Testament laws that said you can only have this sacred bread if you've kept yourself pure in certain ways. David replied, indeed, women have been kept from us. As usual, whenever I set out, the men's bodies are holy, even on missions that are not holy. Now, how much more so today? So he just keeps lying. The guy's lying. I've got an army, right? Like, this place is surrounded. Really? I don't see them. It's like something in a movie. Yeah. So the priest gave him the consecrated bread, since there was no bread there except the bread of the presence that had been removed from before the Lord, replaced by hot bread on the day it was taken away. Now, while he's telling this whole lie, one of Saul's servants, the guy that's trying to kill him, one of his servants was there that day, detained before the Lord. This is interesting, this line, detained before the Lord. It was like God was actually putting a witness there to see how David was going to respond. And David ain't doing too well. His name was Doeg, the Edomite, Edomite, Saul's chief shepherd. So David asked to him, like, hey, don't you have a spear or a sword here? I haven't brought my sword or any other weapon because the king's mission was so urgent. He sent me on a secret mission that was so urgent, I couldn't even bring my pistol. <laughs> like, the lie is just really, it's a stupid lie. Now, this is where it gets really fascinating. Then the priest replied, well, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, is here. Hello, wake up, buddy. Don't you remember God took care of you when you fought Goliath? But David's freaking out because everything he loves and, and lives for is being threatened. He says, it's wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you want it, take it. There's no sword here but that one. He gave him a chance in that moment to say, hey, are you going to trust me? Remember? Remember the, the giant? We slayed that thing together. The sword of Goliath, how random is that that the sword of Goliath is there? The very thing that should remind him that God took care of him in the past. But when he's freaking out, fight or flight, he's going into deception, manipulation, lying, coercion. And this is the really sad part. Doeg, the shepherd, goes back to Saul and is like, dude, the, the priest just helped Saul. So here's what, or just helped David. So Saul's mad. He goes, the king ordered Doeg, turn and strike down the priests. The guy who had been lied to, didn't even know he was being lied to, thought he was helping out Saul, he ends. So Doeg the Edomite turned and struck them down. And that day he killed 85 men. He killed 85 priests. The war the linen ephod means the priest's garments. He killed 85 priests because of David's lie, through no fault of their own. David trying to take things into his own hands. 85 priests died. He also put to the sword Nob, the town of the priests. He's like, while you're at it, just wipe out the whole town. No fault of their own. Can you imagine that? You're just minding your own business. You open your door and somebody strikes you down with a sword. We don't even know what we did. All because one dude lied. With it, it's men and women, it's children, it's infants, and it's cattle, donkeys, and sheep. I can't help but wonder if when David was fleeing, when he saw what was coming at him, he remembered. I'm, I'm sure that haunted him the rest of his life. When the news came that because of his lie and deception and not willing, unwillingness to trust God, who had bailed him out before, in his fear and his panic, he took up his own defense and it ended up costing the lives of lots and lots of other people. And I can't help but wonder if that's why David didn't take off and say, you know what? We're going to fight the battle eventually, but this is not the place to do it because too many people are going to get hurt and too many people are going to die. And really, this authority he's given me is from him anyways. And so if he wants me in this role, I'm going to release it and trust that he's going to bring me back to where I'm supposed to be. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think that's the battle we fight all the time, especially fighters like me. 
And if you're a flighter, you face this battle too because your tendency is going to be to run away and figure out ways to get things, protect your own little world when God's like, no, I just need you to release everything to me and trust me with your whole future. I need you to trust the situation with your son. I need you to trust in the situation with your spouse. I need you to trust in the situation with your finances. I need you to stop fighting because a lot of people are getting hurt in the process of you trying to hold on to something. And maybe when you release it, I'll give it back to you. Or maybe I won't. But if he doesn't give it back to you, it's probably something you didn't need anyway. You can be certain it's something you didn't need. There are times in our personal lives when we have to fight. And there are times in our personal lives when we have got to let the Lord fight the battle for us. And I wish I could give you a real clear answer when those times are, but I don't. I can't. But you know who can? The Holy Spirit can guide you and direct you. And that's why it's so important to be led by the Spirit, which is what I led off with with from Pastor Marcus. If you are not listening to the Spirit of God speaking to you things that confirm what's in the Bible, which is also why it's important to understand what's in the Bible, stories like this. You've got to understand what the context was. And when you, when you take that, God's going to illuminate in your mind what you need to do in your unique situation. Now, we have 10 minutes left, and I'm going to jump into something. This is a P.S. That sermon's over. Here's a new sermon. I've been really frustrated with this situation with Ukraine. Because I, it didn't need to happen, right? Like, we disarmed Ukraine a few years ago. We said, if you give us all your nukes, we'll protect you. And then we didn't. It's just not right. It is what it is. You say, well, that was, that's not our problems over there. Well, maybe it's not our problems, but we made a promise and we didn't stand up to it, right? right. So that is a problem. When you make a commitment, you follow through with it. And we said, hey, don't worry, we'll protect you from Russia. And here we are in this situation. Now, this is where it gets really tricky. Because... There's this verse that I don't like in Romans. Again, another one. It says this. It said, Let every person be subject to governing authorities, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be very afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Now, there's a big confusion in our country right now because I hear a lot of people basically saying that Jesus wasn't very Jesus-like because they think they know what Jesus was like. Because Jesus said things like this that really starts to confuse you, right? Jesus said this, Hey, to the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away from your cloak, don't withhold your tunic either. Remember the whole turn the other cheek thing? Now, it's really important to understand that Jesus said this. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you individually, this, to one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. He never said that to governments. In fact, what he said to governments is, if there's evil in the land and you don't eradicate it, you're held responsible. So the government is not held to the turn the other cheek. They're actually held to uphold a standard of justice. And when they're not allowed to enforce the justice, our society comes to ruin. And you're like, some of y'all are like getting really uncomfortable because I'm talking politics. But this is super important stuff, y'all, because we've gotten things confused. On an individual level, we are called to turn the other cheek. When somebody does you wrong, you turn the other cheek. But governments are never called to turn the other cheek. They are called to enforce justice, truth, and righteousness. And that's why you should be afraid of the government when you're not doing justice, truth, or righteousness. If the government is being honest and true and righteous like they're supposed to be. But the government's never called to turn another cheek, which is why there are just wars. There are wars that are just to be fought. There are things that need to be addressed. And this is where it gets really con confusing. Because in our personal lives, oftentimes we want to take responsibility for stuff to fight that we really don't have any responsibility for. What you're responsible for is doing justice, loving mercy, and walking humbly before your God, Micah 6, 8, in the realm in which you have authority and control. So you've got to look around you, and you, you look at the government, you're like, they're doing so many wrong things, but the question is, what are you doing? Are you turning the other cheek? Are you walking in righteousness? Are you being honest? And you focus on that. And now listen, as authority is given to those in authority by God himself, it's their responsibility how they're going to do justice within their domain. And so you pray for those leaders, and you pray that they'll do what's right and do what's just. 
And the really tricky thing in our democracy is this. We pick the leaders. So there's a lot of responsibility on us for who we pick. And there's this verse. It's a really uncomfortable verse. 1 Samuel 8. I should have put it up here, but it's kind of like a, you know, something should be on a Hallmark card. I'm just kidding. It shouldn't be. It says this. The people cry out. Israel cries out to Samuel and they says, we need a king. And Samuel's like, you don't want a king. A king will make your kids go off to war. He'll take taxes from you. I want to be your king. And they're like, no, we want a king. And God's like, okay, fine. But listen, a day's going to come when you're going to call out to me because of the king you chose, and I'm not going to listen. Again, not something we put on Hallmark cards. Because he's going to be like, you made your bed. Make better choices of your leaders. And that's where we're at in our country today. We are called to respect the government and respect our leaders. But the weird situation we're in is for the first time in history, that's why what they call American exceptionalism, everybody's like, does that thing mean America's better than everybody else? No, American exceptionalism just means there's never been a government system like this in the history of the world where we get to choose our leaders. That's what American exceptionalism is. Again, some people are getting irritated that I'm even using that word, but it's, it's not this idea that we're better than everybody else. It's the idea that there's never been a government quite like this, by the people, for the people, based on certain fundamental rights. And we've got this unique opportunity to really choose good leaders. Now, we've had a kind of slim pickings on good leaders recently. And we've had to choose the worst of two evils, or the better of two evils, excuse me. Sometimes we choose the worst of two evils. And we're in this unique situation, but, but here's what it comes back to. What can you do about those government officials? You can pray for them. Pray that the Lord shows them the light. Because, man, ain't nobody can show you the light like God can. But in the meantime, what you've got to do is you've got to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly before your God right where you are. And that's the hope for the world. The hope for the world is that you walk in righteousness right where you are. And you choose, Lord, I'm going to not fight this battle because I trust you're going to fight it. But then there's some battles that you say, I am going to fight this even though I don't want to because I know you're telling me to fight this battle. And only you can hear from the Lord on that. I can't hear from the Lord for you. Only you can hear. And I wish I had a nice little bow to put on this message today, but I don't. I guess the bow is this. These are really complicated and tricky times. It's really hard to know, uh, you know, like respecting the government. Like, well, I didn't pick that guy in charge, right? But still, you, all, you have to submit to authority. But it doesn't mean you have to keep them in authority. And you get to vote about it. So you got to get honest about yourself and you got to let go of your political predispositions. Well, my mama was always a Republican. My daddy was always a Democrat. Who freaking cares? Figure out what you are. And more importantly, figure it out based on what are the key principles in the Bible that the Lord holds dear. And you got to decide based on that because we're at a turning point. Our country could go one way or another. We're, I mean, we could be invaded at some point. You never know. And you got to figure out what you really believe based on the Bible, not based on a political ideology. And look, the real challenge we have in America is there's only two political parties, and both of them are screwed up. Which is why it requires the Holy Spirit to guide you into what you're supposed to be choosing. You know, in a lot of countries, there's like 17 different parties, and they all have to kind of come and get along. Like, well, we don't agree with you on that, but we'll agree with you on that, and we'll come together. The problem is we're so bifurcated. We're like so divided because there's only two options. You Republican, you Democrat. Well, I'm neither. Well, pick one. That's the challenge we face. And my, my point for you guys is today, you're going to really have to seek the Lord and trust Him. Trust that your future is in His hands. No matter what happens in our country, no matter who's in charge, trust that your future is in His hand, and you make the decisions in your life about what battles to fight and what battle not to fight based on guidance from the Holy Spirit, but recognizing this. If you take up the wrong battle, a lot of, there will be a lot of unnecessary carnage. Bloody people left in the street because of your decisions. And sometimes the best decision is to say, God, I'm just going to let you fight this battle for me. And that goes completely counter to my nature. Because remember, I'm a fighter. So I don't know where you are today, and I don't know where this message hit you, but I really want to encourage you guys to dig deep over the next few weeks. Let this crisis in the world strike, strike a chord in you that you need to really know 
what God wants from you. Stop listening to the news. Stop reading, you know, just get in your Bible for weeks on end and just get in there and, and, and seek counsel from Christians and don't be listening to, to, to the opinions around you. Seek what God has for you and he will guide you and direct you. And you may need to fight a battle or you may need to go, I'm gonna let the Lord fight this one for me. Even though I want to, everything within me wants to fight this one. I'm gonna let him fight this one for me because ain't nobody can fight a battle like the Lord can fight a battle. You guys receive that? All right. I, I hate going into politics, but man, this what like this stuff that we believe, it should impact how we vote and stuff like that. So I want to get into anyway. Enough apologizing. Lord, we thank you so much for your goodness to us. I thank you that we live in this amazing free country. As much as the freedoms are being eroded, Lord, I thank you that we have the freedom to speak our, our thoughts, our mind. And um, I just pray, Lord. For our leaders we pray for our leaders lord that, and that they will be people of integrity and lord i pray that we will be people of integrity so that we vote in people of integrity because you get what you deserve like you get you basically get the leaders you deserve so i thank you lord that we're going to be people of integrity walking in righteousness doing justice loving mercy and walking humbly right in our world but i also pray that our government will be a government of justice and truth and righteousness upholding the standard of righteousness we thank you lord if you're here this morning and you do not have a relationship right with Jesus, this is your chance to do it. I'm going to say a prayer. If you say this and mean it with your heart, Jesus is going to come into your life. He's going to change you, put you on the path. Yeah, he's just going to put you on the path that you need to be on. So we're going to say this prayer. If you say this and mean it in your heart, Jesus is going to come and change your life. Let's say this prayer together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.